Thank you for listening to the Maker in the Mix podcast, where we discuss design, innovation, and all things concrete. Recording in progress. Uh, morning, Jeff, and uh, morning, listeners to Maker Good in the Mix. Good morning, Welcome everybody. Welcome to episode 21. Um, I think we got a good one lined up for you. Um, so uh, this one is gonna gonna be a little bit um, maybe uh, ethereal, esoteric. I don't know. It, it's it's more about it's more, more about, about the maker, not the mix. That's right. Uh, it, it's it's more about philosophy than anything else. So. Um, I want to read something to you. I'm not going to reference it. I'm just going to read it. Uh, and then, and then I want to chat about it real quick. Um, and this is to all of you. Jeff and I have been talking about this for, for a, a while. Um, but it says, uh, avoid foolish controversies and arguments because they are unprofitable and useless. War, um, warn a, defi- a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and self-condemned. And I just think that's a really lovely piece of wisdom. Um, there's, you know, if you are in the industry, um, perhaps you know that I'm referencing referencing something in particular, and I'm not going to give that the dignity of of any more airtime. Um, I it's it's human nature to want to get involved, jump in, defend yourself. Um, you know, there have been certainly falsehoods that have been said and accusations that have been made and names that have been called. And uh, admittedly, Jeff and I have had a little bit of uh, foolish fun getting involved in that from time to time. It's just not worth it. And it's not helpful to you, um, the the listeners. It's not helpful to our mission as, you know, CCI, um, you know, our goal is to build you up, the artisan, uh, to help you find better techniques to not only make amazing craft concrete, but also to build your business. Um, mm-hmm. You know, finding those right connections, networking, um, and and building those relationships because ultimately that's what business is really about. You know, we're in business to be in business. We're not in business to win some game. Um, right. And that I think is the ultimate um version of our of our mission is is we want you to be successful and so we have decided to put down foolish controversies and focus on you the artisan on you the listener um and focus on helping you be successful and that's really what we're here for so um that's my you know 35 second two minute and 57 second spiel uh, on, you know, what we're about and, and why we're really here. We're not on this podcast to, to throw, you know, mud at other people. We're not on this podcast to vilify uh, methods or mixes or ingredients or um, anything like that. We want you to have so- sound, solid, foundational understanding of how things work um, and, and how business is done. And like I said, um, you know, we're playing, we're playing a game to stay in the game. And, uh, mm-hmm. that's, that's something that, um, that we want to, you know, just really drive home. Absolutely. So as many of you know, I started CCI in, next April will be 20 years ago. So crazy. 20 years ago, CCI was formed. I got started doing this even longer before that, not five years before that, so in 99. So it will be uh, 24 years, 25, 24, 25 years next year. All right, long time. Quarter century. A party, don't you think? Something like that. Yeah, have at least a beer. Um, and <laughs> although, you know, I got literally the my first project was just for my house. And the story, how I got started is on the CCI website. So if you're really interested is to learn about my history and the history of CCI. You can go read about that. It's on the about page. But my mission, my goal has always been to help people, to elevate and to educate. And the mechanics of of that process start with 
first building a relationship and then conveying information. I have information about things that my students and my my audience, our audience, want to have. They sure. don't have it or they don't have a complete version of it. And they look to us as experts to convey it to them. Now, I would be a foolish, arrogant person to think that I'm the only one who has all the answers. I don't. I draw from a very vast and very public resource of technical information, engineering classes and things like that uh, that I've taken. You can see my diploma. So I've taken stuff, right? There's a, a, a very large body of information of, you know, how to make a how to make a mold, how to put forms together. You know, mm -hmm. folks who build cabinets know very well how to assemble pieces of melamine and to build a box, right? So it's no secret there. Um, understanding what a pozzolan is and how it works in cement chemistry is, although it's not common knowledge, it's certainly not knowledge that is locked away and and, and available only to the 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 select few. You can go on online. The internet is an amazing thing, an amazing resource. Now, the the challenge and, and my role that I see as, as, as an educator is I'm not here to disgorge information that I have that you don't have. My role is to, to increase understanding because you may have heard things or you may know things. You may know things I don't know. But I'm here to help you understand, to interpret, to condense a vast array of, of knowledge, maybe about how concrete cures or how sealers work or, or something like that. I'm just using these as, as examples. And it's, you know, on the first level is if you can understand something, then you can begin to master it. And if you can begin to master it, you can then be can sorry, it's early, then begin, can begin to become successful and grow, right? So that's really what this today's to topic is going to be about. It's, mm -hmm. it's moving beyond the mechanics of knowing how to build a form or how to mix concrete or knowing which ingredient to put in or, or what sealer to use or how to make a particular color or any of those things, right? There's a vast array of very talented people that can talk to you about that. They can show you great techniques. They can teach you from everything from working with extremely dry, hard packed concrete to extremely fluid, you know, basically watery concrete that are all strong, that give you different looks and things like that. That's the mechanical level. So that's where you begin. Everybody begins at the mechanical level. It's learning how to trowel concrete if that's what you want to do. It's learning how to polish concrete if that's what you want to do. It's learning how to build uh, curved forms or using rubber or developing a new color or something like that, right? It's all very mechanical. Mm -hmm. And what I've seen over the years, and I've talked to a lot of people from all over the world, is we all get in this because we want to be creative, right? There's an inner passion and we want to express that. And we love this material concrete and we want to share that with people. And we know that there are other people out there who want concrete, but don't want to actually do it. So we provide a service. This is a service industry. We're providing a service to craft something out of concrete we're basically distilling emotions into a solid chunk of something, whether it's a countertop or a chair or a bathroom vanity or a sculpture or whatever, right? doesn't matter. And we do this because we want to exchange our craft, our skill, our passion, our creativity for money. That's really what it comes down to. Because when you're in business, the reason why you're in business, and this is often seen as a very dirty thing in this industry, is you are in a business to make money, to feed your family, 
to pay your employees so they can feed your, their families and to grow. Mm-hmm. That's, that's business. Now, we're not trying to exploit anything. We're not trying to charge a million dollars for something that costs us a penny. So we're not exploitive, but we want to be fair. So, you know, I'm, I'm not well, going to dip into the whole capitalist thing, but the purpose of a business is to, to create profit to grow to earn money, to sustain ourselves. And we can yeah. do that modestly or not. The first stage is mastering the mechanics <laughs> so that you're comfortable and confident so that you can then present your wares and your services to the world. Which I would say is, is you know, I want to I want to interject, Jeff. Yes, um, please do. You know, first, that that's kind of part of, one. That's the beginning stage. Yeah, that's part one too of of what we you know run through in our ultimate course in person course, um, and you know, but I, I want to kind of back up just a touch because you you touched on something about knowledge, um, and and you know, we together have spent a great deal of time developing knowledge. I've spent you know ten years learning under you, um, and so there's a great deal of you know knowledge that that I've gained, that you've gained mm-hmm. over the number of years that we've been in this. Certainly your education has a lot to, a lot to do with that. But I also think there's, there's something um, that, that we're trying to capture, and that is the ability to interpret information. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, when we think about, uh, we're going to be releasing Jeff's lecture on post-tensioning, uh, for instance. And, you know, that is a, it's a theoretical lecture on, on, a concept, you know, it's not intended to be taken as, oh, well, you can use a wrench and tighten it and this much, and you know, because every situation is different. But um, the concept of it is something that Jeff distilled into information that we can, you know, we, we laymen um, can understand easily. And that I think is the, um, you know, to me, that's the mark of somebody who is not only an expert at something, but somebody who is is qualified and, and, and an expert at, at teaching somebody is because if you can take a, a complex concept and distill it down to something that a layman can understand, then you've got the concept. Um, and so, you know, that's something I think is really important and something that we really stress is not only are we trying to show you the information, but we're actually what we really want is to teach you how to interpret the information so that you yourself can solve those problems for yourself. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, the, you know, we want to hear from everybody, but when you think about it, the best client is the one you never hear from again, because you've done your job Absolutely. well, you've, you know, you've properly educated them and things like that. And you want to become, you want to develop relationships with these people. So on some level, it's like, I want to hear from you again. Uh, you know, if you're a client, I want to hear from you again. I want to know that you're loving the thing that I made for you. But also like if you're a, and if you're a student or an alumni, you know, of CCI, we want to have long term, you know, I want to have a 20 year relationship with you. I want to be yeah. friends with you in 20 years. But I also, you know, think that there's a an early stage of troubleshooting and developing those techniques and talents and, and helping you kind of get those answers for yourself. And then at some point, you know, the hope is that you start talking to us about the technical side of things. And it's like, oh, well, I learned this and I figured this out. And like, what do you think about this? And, you know, being in that back and forth and that to us is the mark of, of our success, because if we're constantly giving you techno babble and, and forcing you to come back to the fountain to drink, then we're not doing our jobs very yeah. well. We don't know? want to sell you fish. We want to teach you how to fish. Yeah. And what, what crossed my mind is like, I don't have kids. Like we, we don't have kids. You have kids, Caleb. And you have two little boys and, an, and another one on the way. I'm, I'm about so to have three little boys. <laughs> you got about two little boys. I have, I have three cousins. So I know, I kind of know where, who are all bar- brothers that are pretty close in age. So I kind of know where you're coming from. Um, my, our students, and I'm going to talk more in the past tense, but certainly this is uh, applicable to all future students. You're my children. And there's, I can only imagine this is very similar. In the beginning stages, there's a hierarchical relationship of the parent knowing 
and teaching and correcting and the child learning to become a human, to learning how to become an adult. And at some point, they kind of become independent and they start on their own. They, 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 the, the, the birds leave the nest, so to speak. Yeah. And we want to see our students. We want to see our, our friends do that. And we want to be there the whole way because we want to stand with you and be proud of you and hear your success stories, hear all about the things that you, the choices you've made and the successes you've had and celebrate those. Everybody's going to stumble and trip on the sidewalk and skin their knee. Everybody does it. It's, there's no secret. It's what do you do after that? And do you, do you get back on that bicycle and, and learn how to ride it? And then once you learn how to ride it, what do you do there? Do you, do you ride it because you love the exercise? Do you jump over things? Do you like, you know, riding for a long distance? You like to ride fast. What do you like to do with it? Like, where do you want to go? Yeah. Well, and, and that, that children analogy is super, you know, I think it's very comprehensive because, you know, something I've, you know, in the, in the gosh, 2013. So October will be 10 years since I took, um, the ultimate course. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I would suggest that I've graduated. <laughs> um, yeah, I would, I would think so. <laughs> you know, but, uh, but, I, but I look at, I mean, to your point, you know, that's the, that's the kind of relationship that we want, right? Like we want this, you know, up front, you know, I think student applies, right? And then because I think there's, there's like you said, a hierarchical sort of relationship, we're giving knowledge to the people taking the course, um, and we take that super seriously. But then after that, it's like, hey, actually, you know, at some That's point, I want my you. kids to become my friends. You know, right now, you know, my house, my rules, I, you know, I, I tell them all the time, like, sorry, but it's not a democracy here. Like, mm -hmm. right. you know, I it's, it's sick, by the way, we've seen them. So, <laughs> yeah, no, they come in all the time. They're at school now. Um, but, you know, they they have to live a certain way in my house mm -hmm. because I'm raising them to be men. You know, I want my boys to grow up to be competent young men. And so, um, at some point my, my prayer and hope and goal is that they become my friends, much like m myself and my father. Um, my dad's one of my best friends. Mm -hmm. Uh, we do things together. We hang out. We, you know, it's like he comes over for whiskey and we, go hiking together and well we don't do as much as i'd like to but we you know uh, sure. like we do stuff together we go places together we hang out and and you know there's still that element of you know he's my dad and so there's there's he's lived longer life than me and so there's stuff that we haven't gotten to yet that i still don't know and and so you know i what? think there's, that's that's what we're after you know there's what you're doing now with your boys and what you have with your dad and always will have is respect. Right. And to me, respect is incredibly important. Um, well, and trust it, is too, because and we trust, right? Trust and know, respect go together because if I, somebody is untrustworthy, you can't have respect. And if somebody doesn't respect you, how can you trust them? Well, and I think coming from that place of, I mean, and this is getting so uh, philosophical and I love it. I love conversations like this. Um, because like, so every night before bed, so no matter what, no matter how shitty their attitudes have been, no matter what their day has been like, no matter the, the, the circumstances, right. Every single night I read to my children. Um, and then I tuck them in and, and like, this is like my favorite part of the day. It's my bedtime's my job you know, mama stays home all day. And so, you know, it's like, I, I kind of relieve her after dinner and I do bedtime. So we, you know, the brushing the teeth thing and, mm -hmm. um, you know, I help them get their jams on and then read to them. Uh, and then I tuck them in. And so, um, I have an incredible amount of fun doing this. I'm reading the second Harry Potter book right now. Um, and I do a horrible British accent and it's really, really fun. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, 
And, uh, Let's see and what. then when I tuck them in, every night I say the same thing. I say, do you know that I love you? And they say, yes. I say, do you know that there's nothing bad you could ever do to make me love you less? They say, yes. Do you know that there's nothing good you could ever do to make me love you more? And then, and so that it's, it's a setting the stage for like, I might be hard on you. Mm -hmm. I might yell at you. I might, th there might be a consequence to something you've done. And all of that is done in love because I'm trying to make you a better person. I'm trying right. to make you into a person. I'm trying to make you into a, a man. Right. Um, and, and I think that, that really analogy, what's the word for that? Um, to make something an analogy, uh, analogy. Analogous. It's, it's analogous to parenthood in that way, because like, we really care, you know, yeah. we really want to see you succeed. Um, you know, we've got students all over the world. I'm, I'm so beyond privileged and blessed to talk to people from all over the world. I was talking to, um, Terry over in Australia the other day. And like, we've got, it's, it's just amazing to have this community and, um, and we are dedicated to your success. It's like, yeah, we've developed products to make your life better. Um, and, and all of those things. And of course we want to sell them. Of course we want to make money. Of course we want to support ourselves. Like that's kind of, you know, we're in business, right? But, but the reason that that business exists in the first place is because we want to help. Right. So uh, you saw me get up. Yeah. This is one of the books my dad used to read to me. Rutabaga stories. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really remember <laughs> what the content is. They're You're going to have to go read them later, right? right? But. There, I have two books. There's another one over there. But my dad used to read this to me, and I and I still have the books, so I know exactly what you're talking about, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, my dad, uh, my dad used to, you know, used to call me sport when I was about my my kid's age. <laughs> I never played sports. I wasn't a sporty kid. I wasn't cool. But my dad called me sport, and if I guarantee, if he walked through the door and called me sport right now, it would bring back a lot of, you know feelings and memories. And, um, and, you know, I also want to be sensitive to, there are folks out there who don't have good relationships with their parents. Um, and I, I just want to be super sensitive to that, uh, of course, but that's really the goal of, you know, what we're doing with CCI. It's the goal of, you know, what Jeff and I are about as people. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Jeff has been, I mean, yeah, I know you don't have kids. Um, but I kind of feel like one of them, you know, I've, I've spent 10 years being mentored by you and at, at zero times in history of, of my relationship with Jeff, have I felt like he's been out for anything other than, you know, my good and, and being in business with him, I can tell you that for certain, because there are, you know, things that both of us have done and will do that are like, Oh, that probably wasn't, wasn't the most, um, business oriented thing it was about the person right you know and and so and sometimes and this is where the the human nature and the human element it comes back to play and it's very important to, to us is sometimes we have to make decisions that are not the best for us from a business perspective mm -hmm. but it's good for you so here's a good example Sealers have been my big thing since day one. And yeah, I, I remember you, you who had know the reputation my of long you're, history. Know you're the one sealers... who can make concrete that doesn't crack and doesn't stain. Right, right. <laughs> and, you. Um, you know, you know there, there were, it's like a puzzle, right? There are solutions to puzzles. And I chose well, a particular in this case, solution. It's a solution. Um, there's no, it's no secret. I, I chose coatings, topical coatings, right? not the thick plasticky coatings people invoke, like the thick of bar top epoxies. Um, we're talking about micro thin sealers. Of course, way back in the old days, those didn't exist. So they were more like your thick plastic, plastic coatings, your driveway coatings, things like that. Anyway, uh, where was I going with this? Um, so for the longest time, I had the, I, recommended certain particular products because they worked 
They worked for me. They stood up to the tests that I developed to well, it evaluate takes you a them. long time to get um, into something from that standpoint because and I recognized that as new as more products came on the market, you know, people had more options and and there were ways to evaluate them and and say, okay, which is better, which is whatever, right? Have some sort of metric. But by and large, I stayed out out and I'm and deliberately did not try to create my own thing. I wanted to be objective and say, I'm going to stand back and evaluate what other people create, whether it's a, a an ad mixture or a sealer or a tool or whatever, and, and make recommendations that way. Um, kind of like I was trying to be the consumer reports mm -hmm. um, of concrete. And the frustrating thing, and this is when I decided to develop Omega, and I'm not going to get into a whole lecture on sealers, but the reason why I chose to create a, my own sealer versus continually to recommend products that are on there, there were a lot of products on the market st that are still on the market. And the reason why I didn't is because none of them ticked all the boxes that I felt were important, certainly to me, but honestly, what my opinion is, is not really that important. What's more important, more relevant was there weren't a, a number of sealers. There weren't really any sealers on the market that ticked the boxes that I felt were critically important to my customers, to the industry, and more importantly, to the industry's customers, the people who ultimately buy this stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. For instance, if I had a sealer that offered incredible protection, but it was really difficult to get it to look good every single time, maybe that's not the best, you know, if you have to keep recoding it over and over again to get it right, maybe that's not the best product to be using. Or perhaps something that looked and felt really good, but you never knew, was water going to leave a white mark in it? Did acid etch it? Um, did it work? Is it going to work or not? Was it, well, what was and the then definition? Also, there are the you thick know, plastic coatings and you don't want that. Right. And you also don't want something solvent based because there's health risks in, you know, right. involved. And I don't want to have a product that it's just a really narrow fills up six months afterwards, because as the, con as the sealer cures and shrinks, it self delaminates. And so you All create, these are create descriptions of real products that either are on the market or not. You know, directly. So I, 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 I bit the bullet, and I'm. I said, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to create a sealer because, oh wow, this is great. Because honestly, it'd be so much easier to go out there and and find some product manufacturer and take their product and just relabel it and stick it in a can and and sell it. Right. That'd be the, that's the easy solution, but that's what everybody else does. And you see the results. It's like, well, I, I take this box and this box, but I don't get that box. And now over time, you know, I've done the same thing with um, the alpha line of products. So we've got a, a defoamer, a dry polymer, and um, an incredibly powerful super plasticizer fluidizer. Right, which is these are not products that, that I'm are not selling. mainstream. The, those right. things are not, uh, you know, quote unquote, like white label or down packed. Like, no, these are these are raw materials that are not mainstream and and you know, not the same as anything else right. that's on the market. So, and and you can tell that because you just use them and you see, wow, everything else is here, and then my stuff, CCI stuff, is is here. It's expensive to do that. It's a pain in the butt to do that. It takes a long time to do that. We're talking years of development, not something you just spontaneously go out, oh, I'm gonna, you know, meet a new vendor and cool, I'll relabel something and slap it in a can and sell it to people. I wanna understand it. And I do this for a reason. I do this because I see the the needs of our customers as their business changes. Like back 
way back in the old days, uh, before GFRC was really a thing at all, you know, there were two ways to cast concrete. There was the Chang way and the Buddy Rhodes way. So Futung Chang did basically wet cast. He used an aggregate based concrete, whether it was basically like what you'd get out of a truck, right? right. Modified and things like that, but basically aggregate based, wet cast, cream finish. That was his look. Really cool. Extremely different from Buddy's look, which was a mortar based, all sand, stiff, hand packed, sticky kind of concrete, lots of texture, lots of voids. That's Buddy's look. So you either did one or you did the other. And there was no in between. Um, as time progressed and GFRC came on the scene, you know, all of a sudden now you're spraying concrete, you're hand packing, perhaps you're pouring things. And the, the process of making, the mechanics of making a piece of concrete, the time has changed, the techniques have changed, the materials have changed, um, things have gotten more efficient, more effective. Um, it used to be, this was the industry standard, when you ordered a piece of concrete, when a customer contacted one of the handful of companies on the market, it was six to eight weeks to get a piece. And mm -hmm. these pieces were pretty basic, right? You didn't, you didn't have your 15, 18, 20 foot long slabs. You didn't have cool looking thin furniture. You didn't have any of that stuff. You couldn't. It was two or three inch thick concrete that was maybe six or eight feet long. That was about it you know, real basic blocky stuff. And it took a long time because that technology was primitive by today's standards. It was advanced compared to sidewalk concrete. So you have to always have a comparison, right? We are so far outside of, you know, that was Wright Brothers plane. Now we're flying around an SR-71, which is actually <laughs> old technology, right? Yeah, well, and it hasn't been beat yet, so. <laughs> hasn't been beat yet, so that we know of, right? Um, You're right. Yeah, that's a good point. As our industry changes, so it's like a race. We have the tools, the ingredients, the mix designs, the sealers. They're pushing the envelope, right? We want to get better and better. And then our creativity, our techniques take advantage of that. And now mm -hmm. we push further and further. Okay, that's all mechanical, right? That's all cool. That's all fun to do. You're building a better mousetrap. You're building that 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 nanoscale digital mousetrap. But none of that matters if you don't have a market to sell that to. None mm -hmm. of that matters if you keep having problems because you don't have a process that helps you eliminate mistakes. None of that matters if you don't have a reliable support system or to somebody to mentor or somebody to share your ideas with. Mm -hmm. It's about what's beyond the mechanics. It's about the relationships. It's about the human to human connection. Right. And that's kind of where we're, that's what we're focusing on. It's not just about making a cool flashy product to sell people and get them excited about Ooh, I can now make a cool looking piece of concrete because look at my concrete. It looks like lava. All right. That's the mechanics of it. Mm -hmm. Important, but important at this level. Right. We want to be up here. We want to be up here because that's where you need to be to be successful. Well, and, and you sent me a video the other day, Jeff, that kind of illustrated this really, really well. And it, um, Simon Sinek, I, I don't know if that's how you pronounce his last name. Uh, it's how it seems to be spelled. So we're going to go with it. Um, and he had, uh, in, in the same year, he did um, a talk at, at one company and a talk at another company. You can go look this up or whatever. I'm not going to give company names. I don't need to be dealing with any of that. But at one company, he said, and these are both very, very large, very well-known companies. He Everybody said, knows them. Everyone knows them. He said, at, at one company, 70% of the time, 70% uh, of 70% of their executives' time was devoted to how to beat their competitor. Okay. So that's a lot of mental space taken up by a competitor. Um, and we've been guilty of this, right? Um, we don't want to be guilty of it in the future. So that's where we're coming from. But at the, um, and then subsequently, 
after he gave his talk, this company gave him their new flagship product. Okay. Um, and he said it was great. Um, and then he went and he did a talk at uh, this other company. Also big name. Everybody knows it. This particular company's competitor. And he said 100% of the executive's time, 100% of the time of 100% of their executives was dedicated to, this is in the tech space, um, <clears throat> to making uh, teaching easier for teachers and learning easier for students. They had a mission. Um, and then he was subsequently in, in the car with one of the executives from company number two. And he, he was like, I like to stir the pot. So I pulled out this product that was a competing product. And he was like, well, this is so much better than your product. It's so good. It does this. It does that. And the executive was like, I'm sure it is. And that was okay. the end of the conversation. Um, the point of all that being, we want to play as, as a company, as, as CCI, we want to play an infinite game. There are finite games and there are infinite games. Finite games are defined players, defined rules, defined time. There's a goal. Business you is, win. You, you, you play to win. Name me a company that has won mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the annals of time. I can tell you a lot of companies have lost. And generally, I mean... <laughs> MySpace didn't lose to Facebook. They lost to, or, you know, they didn't, I'm sorry, they didn't even know about Facebook. They didn't lose to the company that they were fighting. They were fighting some company I've never heard of. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the thing is we don't, you know, like I said, we've been guilty of this. We have, we have responded in ways we shouldn't have uh, to certain situations. And, you know, we've kind of realized it doesn't matter. Because yeah. we're here for you. <laughs> we're not here for right. competition. We're not here for, uh, you know, the, the, the best product of the year award. I mean, that would be great, right? Like, it's, it's not like we don't want that. But at the same time, at the end of the day, what really matters is, did we help you? Did yeah. we help you be more successful than you were last year? Were we in that relationship with you? Were we in the trenches with you? Were we on your side? Were we in your corner? That's the metric I want to be known for. Mm -hmm. In a way, I'm kind of happy that there are other people wasting their time and energy making things up and stirring the pot and using up all their, their mental energy. Because if they're doing that, they're not helping their customers. Right. Right. So cool. If, they're, if you're too busy convincing people, Letting oh, I've got the best thing ever and it's the best thing ever because it's the best thing ever, yeah. then you're not really like, what are you doing for the people you've committed to serve? Yeah. Because it's about service. It's not, a, you know, that's, that's what we're, yeah. that's what we're after here. So that's, that's our commitment to you. I mean, we're saying this publicly is we're, we're here to, we're here for you. Um, hold us accountable. Talk to us. Yeah. We want, we want to hear that. from you. Like we don't hear enough of, from you guys because yeah. it's not about like historically my role, my role in CCI publicly has been as the teacher, right? On the, on the backside is I'm tech support. Mm -hmm. So if there's an issue with a product, if there's an issue with, Hey, you know, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm faced with a challenge dealing with a customer, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to help, help the student. That's, that's historically been my role. Right. But we want to hear from you more than just, Hey, I have an issue. Help me fix this. Okay. That's again, the basic, that's the mechanical level, which we're, we're hundred percent. We're there for that. <laughs> that. We're there for that. Right. But we want to, we want to hear from you about your success stories. Yesterday I got a text. I was driving home uh, from uh, one of my students in California and he sent some pictures like, look at what I just did, man. It's getting better. Uh, I'm, I'm going to briefly read what he said um, simply because his wording was really nice. Um, Thanks, Jeff. Each one has been getting easier and easier. It's definitely cool making different styles. And the pieces he made were just fantastic. Um, 
And that makes me so happy to hear. It's like, does he still need me? Well, maybe. But my whole existence is not dependent on having people need me. It's about the pride I feel in seeing them, you, do great things and have success. Mm -hmm. That's where I get my energy from. It's not about keeping you locked into having to talk to me about, hey, this isn't working. You said to try this and it didn't quite work and you got to keep coming back to me. That's not how I fill my bucket. Right. Yeah, I mean, I I think that's just, that's the bones of it, you know. Um, I I actually, going back to the the accountability thing, um, super valuable, I'm big on accountability. And, uh, I actually had, uh, had somebody reach out to me about something that was said in the public sphere. And he was like, man, I don't know if that's uh, what you ought to be spending your energy on. I was like, thank you. Yeah. You're a hundred percent right. And, and so, you know, I mean, what is it? Iron sharpens iron. Like I, I want to be sharpened. I want to be better. I want to be, you know, because again, My job, Jeff's job, is to serve you. And I want to be getting better at that all the time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. (laughs) So, kind of getting back to what we kind of started with about Mm -hmm. growing and communicating and building connections. Um, I'm going to turn the focus away from us. And on to, on to you, like when you come to class, right, you're in the mechanical stages. And then when you leave class, you're at a stage where you're starting to, to master. You're starting to learn how to ride that bicycle on your own. Okay? Right. At some point, you decide to take the training wheels off and you, you get going. And the sequence of progress that I've seen. I've seen a lot of businesses over the years. Um, When you break out of that mechanical role and realize that making concrete is, yes, it's fun. Yes, it's passionate. Yes, it's creative. Mm -hmm. But it is the means to an end Mm -hmm. because you as the business owner, your job is to grow your business, to make connections, to develop and grow your market to communicate with the designers, the architects, your individual customers, to find out what their passion and passion is, to collaborate and become a partner with them, to bring whatever their idea is to fruition. So that's like the next level. And then the level above that is you as the professional, you as the master of your material, because ultimately you want to be that, you are creating the paradigm of what concrete can be, what it should be. You're educating, you are the source of education and information for the architects and designers you talk talk to. You become their trusted resource. You become their mentor in how to work and with this material, how to utilize it effectively and efficiently. And that can only happen if you focus on learning and communicating and growing connections with people. It's, it's, it, it becomes in a way kind of full circle because you are not educating the people who you are trying to get business from. Mm-hmm. So it's, in a, in a weird way, it's kind of like you're coming at it from both directions. Well, you're solving problems for each other. You know, Absolutely. there's, there's a, it's a symbiotic relationship. And I think that's where, you know, where, where some people get off is they're like, well, business is all about me. I've got to make money. I've got to do this. And it's like, well, actually, if you want to like be in business for a long time, business is about we, you yeah. know, if you want to be, if you want to play the infinite game, business is about utilizing your skills to help other people solve their problems. Mm -hmm. And yes, there's money that is involved there, 
But at the end of the day, your, your mindset is not about the money. It's about the value. Right. You know, it's about the people because people are valuable. Stuff is not. And, you know, I've, I've spent 10 years developing a craft, right? And I, you know, Jeff and I were talking about uh, this book, E-Myth uh, Revisited, um, a while back. And it's a really good one. Go read it if you haven't. I would highly, highly recommend it. Um, but, you know, it talks a lot about, you know, the kind of technician um, and the person who is, you know, so devoted to the craft that they don't think about the company. Um, and that's where businesses get into trouble and where we hopefully want to, to help you avoid those pitfalls is, you know, we're trying to build a community of people that's more interested in other people and more interested in, um, living a life in, in service to a greater thing, uh, you know, of, of building a community and rising tides and raising ships and of course, building quality things. Um, but you know, there's the, there's a, a movement of craft in the world right now. There's a, uh, and I think it's got a lot of value. You know, people are waking up to the idea that, well, I don't want this mass manufactured thing. I want this thing made by this guy. Yeah, it's going to cost me more money. I get that, but his time is valuable. And and I think, you know, I I heard something recently. You froze on I, me, Caleb, but I think you're okay. I'm on still that, here. But... I'm yeah, still here. Still I there. promise. Uh, <laughs> Something I heard recently um, was, you know, if you have a really, really good friend who owns a business, you shouldn't ask him for a discount. You should <laughs> offer to pay him full retail, mm -hmm. um, not because, you know, but be because you see the value in his work. And so, um, you know, certainly. I want to give, you know, friends of mine deals because that's part of being a friend. But if I'm offered like full price, I'm going to be like, well, thank you. That's fantastic. I appreciate that. Now, I may not accept it, um, but the appreciation is there. Right. Um, anyway, all of that to it's, say. It's your choice to give that gift of a discount, but you shouldn't ask for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so all of that to say, I mean, this is this is a a long and verbose roundabout way of saying People over products, right. people over stuff. Community are, over concrete. Community, that's it. Community over concrete. I love that. And it's true. And it's going to be true after we're gone. It's going to be true, uh, you know, today, tomorrow, and as long as businesses are around community over competition, community mm -hmm. over concrete, um, you know, we want we want the C, the C and the I to stand for more than what it stands for now. You know, right. we want it to stand for compassion and craft and uh, camaraderie and huh? integrity. And yeah, we want the integrity we want. And, and so that. If you take nothing else from uh, a CCI course, which we hope you take a lot out of a CCI course. And we hope you, we hope a lot of you take a CCI course, mm -hmm. but what we hope you take out of a CCI course is the, the community and the knowledge that you have a place to turn to for not just support, but camaraderie and, uh, skill building. And, um, oh my gosh, I cannot be called again. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, so Jeff, talk for a minute while I text this person. <laughs> Airplane mode. Um, over the years, this is something I, that I've noticed. And, uh, Caleb and I were talking a couple days ago about, uh, a fellow student had, who had come to class a few years ago and, and we had re Caleb had reconnected with him. Um, not that he went away. It's just, it's good to realize to reestablish closer connections, to, to be reassuring. Um, and one thing that I've seen, again, it's from a hierarchical point of view. Um, I'm certainly not the most 
easily approachable person, and I can come across as a little bit authoritarian when it comes to information. And my my motivations behind that are from a from a parent, you know, don't touch the hot stove, you're going to get burned. Mm-hmm. That kind of thing. That's that's the mentality here is I want to make sure that you don't you don't fall off a cliff. You don't, you know, make your concrete and have it break and you waste all this time and money and disappoint your customers and hurt your business. So a lot of my motivation is uh, geared toward um, uh, prescriptive and uh, that sort of communication level. Mm-hmm. Uh, fumbling here for the right words. That also that that tends to make it difficult for people to want to talk to me about. Hey, I'm having some issues, and you know, we want you to feel. We don't want you to be intimidated. We don't want you to feel like you're letting us down, or that there's something wrong with you, or that you're we're going to look down on you because you made a mistake and you didn't. You did something that we told you not to do, or you forgot something we told you, or whatever, right? Fill in the blank. I'm just using, I'm just pulling examples out of the air. All right. We are not going to say, oh man, you're dumb. We told you that uh, you should know better. That That's ridiculous. We want, we want you to reach out for anything, whether it's a deeply challenging problem, like, oh man, you know, I'm getting all kinds of curling and warping problems. Why? Help me out. Or, hey, I want to know how to do this. Or, you know, I got a call yesterday on the way home. Uh, one of one of my good, very successful students, like, "Hey, I want to do this particular look. How do I do it? How do I do it?" And so, while while I was driving home on speakerphone, of course, you know, we're we're talking about throwing bouncing ideas back. Oh, well, you could do this or you could do that. Um, and we kind of came up with a game plan. Mm-hmm. Now it was collaborative. It wasn't me saying, oh, you should do this. I know better. And that's the only way to do it. It was, you know, he had some ideas that he came up with, presented them to me. I'm like, yeah, that's on the right track, but let's, let's also maybe try this. Mm -hmm. All right. So once, once you come to class and once I have a basic idea of, see, the great thing about you coming to class is I know what you, I know what you've been taught. Because mm-hmm. we've taught it to you, yeah. so we have a we have a common ground, right? We have a common base of knowledge, and then we can work from that. And I want you to keep learning. I want you to learn. I, I've said this for years. You know, go take classes from other people because they have other great things to share and to learn from. Like I, I don't know everything. I can't teach you everything. In five days, it's impossible to teach everything, right? right? I used to, for, I don't know how many years, 15 years, more than 15 years, speak at World of Concrete. And I did, I was the only one who, for for most of the time, I was the only one who talked about concrete countertops and things like that. And I used to give a three-hour lecture, which for a lot of folks is, you know, terrifying. Stand in front of a room of 700 people and talk for three hours. I'm like, man, it's over in a blink of an eye. And I don't even know how many people are in the room because I don't see people when I, I don't, I don't care. There's 10,000 people, one person, <laughs> or 10, 000, doesn't matter. Like I'm passionate about what I talk about and I'll be up there waving my hands, talking about stuff. I got my 186,000 slides <laughs> <laughs> flicking through. Right. And the challenge was like, they wanted me to teach the, the, the implication of the class was you could come and take this class, this class, it's not a class, it's a lecture, uh, for three hours, and you're going to learn everything there is to know about making concrete countertops. It's like, dudes, oh. I can't do it in, in five days of eight solid hours a day. Like, that's just scratching the surface. You know, having a lecture for three hours is, you know, it's the cliff notes of the cliff notes of, if you know, don't know what that is, it's like, a, a, a cheater summary of a book. So in, instead of reading, you know, of course, this is all just short stories, but like instead of reading like To Kill a Mockingbird or, you know, Catcher in the Rye or or whatever, or War and Peace, it's a it's a like a 30 page summary of it that high school students read when they didn't read the book. They got the cliff notes. Mm-hmm. So. 
learning involves a lot of time and dedication. It's a lifelong endeavor. It's a lifelong yeah. endeavor. And when, you know, when you come to class, you're learning, you're getting auditory information, you're getting visual information, you're getting hands-on information, you're getting written information. And all those are just shorthand versions of what it takes to start to learn the mastery of it. Ultimately, you got to go home and make concrete and do it yourself. Exactly. That's the ultimate goal. All we're doing is giving you the right combination of things so that you're not making garbage up front. <laughs> you're like, okay, I, 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 you know, I know how to make a basic thing, and now I'm going to start. I know, I know how to make it. Maybe it didn't quite turn out the way I wanted it to, but I also know how to evaluate it and correct it. Right. And it's that feedback loop of learning, doing, correcting improving right knowledge leads to experience experience adds to the knowledge base they go hand in hand so yeah. when you come to when you choose to learn from cci you're getting both right and it's a mm -hmm. it's a continual process it's not a fixed thing it's a spectrum of Here's a little bit. Now go go do a little bit. Come back. We'll talk. Do a little bit more, and you grow. Mm -hmm. And I'm very proud to say I have a lot of successful people around the world, not just in the United States, but around the world, um, who are very successful. Yeah. Well, and and something that that I would I would say also um, is. Oh shoot! I just lost my thought. Where'd it go? <laughs> It'll come back. It'll come back. Um, uh, the train gets lost in the tunnel, gets distracted by the little village. It'll come back. So, you know, the proof is in the pudding, right? I've been teaching since oh, 2004. I, um, I have a lot. I've taught all around the world. You know, I've been to Australia six times. I've taught New Zealand, India, Finland, um, Singapore. The obviously Canada. Um, I'm just I can't remember, I remember everywhere, what, right? I remember but saying. I have a lot of really successful people who are, who are just absolutely killing it. Good morning. Good morning. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, can I take a hundred percent for their credit? Of course not. That would be ridiculous of me to do that. But. Are they successful in part because of what I taught them? Absolutely. Right? Yeah. I, uh, I, I, okay. I wanted to back up. I remember what I was going to say. So, See, um, you know, one thing that, that is, is super worth noting is that, you know, certainly as um, makers and, and CCI as a manufacturer of, of materials, we want to make the best possible material, you know, with our goal being to help you, we want you to have the best materials you can have, right? And I think that is the goal of, of manufacturers in general. If you're making a product, you want it to be a good product. Um, and so here's what I would say. You know, uh, certainly we are far and away better than we were as an industry when I started and, and, and even more so since Jeff started mm -hmm. um, in terms of what materials are available. Um, and so I think that by and large, if you as an artisan are picking a material that is around right now that is made for use in this industry, you have a, a large degree of, of a chance of success based on that material. However, mm -hmm. it's not about that. Yeah. And so I think ultimately you can have the best material in the world. You can use the best concrete and... And, and it, you know, maybe it's a bag, maybe it's a from scratch mix, maybe it's a whatever, you know, Acme, whatever. You can use the thing that is the best ever and still fail. Mm -hmm. Because if you fail uh, to, to grasp that your business is about more than just that, you know, then ultimately long term, you're going to burn out. Maybe you don't, maybe your concrete doesn't fail, right? But maybe you burn out because 
you know, all you're doing is making the best concrete and maybe you aren't getting the recognition you feel you should get or, or whatever. Um, and so I think that until, and, and this is true for me, until I realized that it wasn't about the concrete. I mean, obviously, I want you to be good at your concrete. I want to be good at my concrete. That should go without saying. We should make quality concrete. I'm not saying we shouldn't. But at the end of the day, my business is about making something better for somebody else. Um, and so we, we want to, um, we want to use those quality materials to build a business, not just to make a thing. So in other words, all of that to say, uh, the best material in the world is level one. And so you want to build on, you know, well, really it's level two or three because education, you know, is level one. You wouldn't want to, uh, you, you wouldn't want to get heart surgery from somebody who claims that they went to medical school but can't show you the diploma. You wouldn't right. want to, um, you know, or maybe Anybody they can, can play a doctor on TV. Yeah, it's like maybe maybe you got a TV doctor who can show you a... Um, maybe you got a failed like, reality TV show host. I don't know. Well, maybe he maybe he has a degree in something else that's like related, mm -hmm. but isn't actually a doctorate in medical yeah. science or, you know, whatever the case may be. So. Level zero is your passion. Level one is your education. Level two or three somewhere in there is your materials. And then beyond that is your your mindset and your goals and your. The overarching philosophy with which you operate, that's, that's the upper echelon. And, and if you're not operating with the idea that people are more important, then you might be in business for 30 years and walk away empty. Burned out. Yeah. You know, the, and, the, and the, so, the... you know. I, I don't want, just so y'all know, I don't ever want to retire. That's just not a goal I have. I don't want to do backbreaking work forever, but my, as long as I am physically able, I want to help people. And That's that also I'm... means that your business is going to grow and change and evolve and include new directions. And you're going to stop doing things that you used to do. But that doesn't mean you're not still involved. You're not passionate about what you're doing. It's just the things you like and the things you're doing and the directions you're moving towards change. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just like, have seen seen my passions change over the last absolutely. ten years. I've yeah, seen, you I, know, I remember I, some I of the conversations we had a few years ago about like what your when you first moved into your new shop, like what your new ideas were, like you were going to do the thing. And, you know, we, we talked about pricing structures and describing the kinds of projects and what you would do and who the customers would be and, and all that. And I don't hear that anymore. And that, that doesn't mean that that idea has been deleted. It just means that right now you've realized that that's not an important focus for you and your business. Yeah. Maybe, maybe in, 10 years, you go, oh, I got that idea. I'm going to revisit it, but it's going to change and twist and, and, and morph into something new and different. But the focus, like, I'm going to back up a little bit because, uh, you know, years and years ago, back when this, you know, the, 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 the industry as we know it, certainly got started in the in the late 80s, early 90s by Fu Tung Chang and Buddy Rhodes. Oh, let and me make a correction, by the way. I said it was 20 years old. That's last week. And I realized after I published it, I was like, you know, I said that off like kind of as a quip. I'm well aware that the industry is more than 20 years old. Yeah. But well, that the craft is more than 20 years old. I'm not sure the industry is more than 20 years old. <laughs> that That's that's a more accurate statement the because, station. you know, you have a bunch of isolated individual artisans doing their craft and 
as more and more people learn about it, more and more people got interested in doing it. And that's kind of how I got started. And we have a whole story about that that I don't go back into because we've already set, told it. <laughs> but I've seen a lot of folks get into this and they do it because of the way it makes them feel. Like it, it, it's, you know, they're they're a third generation concrete finisher and they've been working, pouring, you know, doing driveways and pouring slabs, doing flat work all their lives. They they did it as a as a teen. They work for their parents or they work, you know, for a company and they've been doing it for this long. And man, you know, it sucked being outside and, and their back's getting sore and and they 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 want to move inside. And so they they have a reason for moving in out of that kind of concrete into our kind of concrete. And I'm not saying this is the natural progression from for folks who start in that place and, and come to us from it's that place. It's definitely a story we've heard a lot, though. But it's, it's definitely a story we've heard a lot. Okay. But then the retired airline pilot or the biology professor or the, you know, grandmother who was uh, on an, a major national infomercial also has come and done this too. The natural progression is to start doing this because of the way it makes you feel. You want to have a creative outlet. You want to do stuff. You see there's an opportunity to make money. And this is the mechanic stage of where people kind of get stuck. And, I, mm -hmm. and I, I've always said this, and I'm going to keep saying this. I'm never going to stop saying this is you need to approach this as a business, not as a hobby. Now, a hobby is an activity that makes you feel good, that you spend money on to make you feel good. I collect figurines. I paint watercolors. I build plastic models. I collect records. Fill in the blank, right? It's a thing you spend money. It's an activity you spend money on that brings you joy. So what's your, what's your hobby, Jeff? <laughs> concrete no <laughs> um i could name a two business of a business right can start as a hobby but it needs to evolve beyond that because a business ultimately is about using that creative passion and that creative energy to create something bigger and in the process of doing that, it generates profit. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't absolutely. just make money; it generates profit. So years years ago, I was at a World of Concrete event doing my thing, and there was another speaker who gave his presentation, and he was talking about his his business, and he kind of made a joke at the I can't remember if it was at the it was at the beginning of his talk. He's like, you know, I, I just want to say. We in my company, we, we had a big celebration this year, kind of talking about the events of the prior year because he spoke every year. He's like, I, I want to um, I want to share this with everybody because this was a big celebration for us. You know, our company, it was our first year. We made our first million dollars. Like that was a big deal for him. Mm -hmm, and he mm -hmm. said, but after the accounting was done, it cost us a million and a half dollars to get there. Right. Just because you make money doesn't mean you actually are keeping money. Being in business doesn't mean you're spending money. You're not buying the most expensive toy or lots of toys or the latest and greatest whatever. It's about growing that business, obviously, to generate profit so you can reinvest in it, so you can reinvest in education, so you can reinvest in a bigger shop, um, better outreach programs. Um, but ultimately, it's about growing a community, a community of certainly customers, but also a community of people who are passionate about concrete, mm -hmm. right? That is what a business is really for. Yeah. And we want to see people who start as a hobby grow out of that pretty quickly and realize that it's not about making the coolest, fanciest, latest and greatest 
finishing technique or casting process or shape and, or and whatever. To be clear, we do want to be on the on the forefront of a lot of those things. Like, oh, if there's absolutely, a, yeah, yeah. If there's a new technique. Here's here's something that honestly we're pretty good at. If there's a new technique that you've like heard about and you don't know how to do, I would be willing to bet that Jeff and I can figure out how to do it well. Yeah, and so we and, would be we would love more than anything to teach you a new technique or to, um, you know, whatever. So. Uh, I, I mean, I think those things are, are no, worth. There are no secrets in this industry, and no. if somebody's done Nothing's it, that means somebody else can do it too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, I, I, we're at an hour and ten minutes, so we should yeah. probably pause. However, as a as a, a I'm going to take a five minute exercise, if you will, Jeff, because you mentioned earlier in the podcast that you know you you're aware that you can be hard to get to know and things like that. Now. I'm going to call myself weird and different because I just blew right past the, uh, the, the social Lauren, my wife, she's like, yeah, you're, you're pretty socially unaware. I'm like, I don't know, maybe, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I don't really pay much attention to, to like the walls and things that people have. So I just, I just blow right past them. So that's how I got to know you. But, um, you know, as like a, a quote unquote icebreaker, if you will, you know, like we do want to get to know you. And so here's how I'm showing you that a um, couple of things I'm really, really into uh, cars. I have a 1972 Chevy Nova in the garage. I've got a 1978 uh, CJ7 in the other garage. Really love, 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 love old uh, big V8 American cars. It's a it's a big passion of mine. Um, and then I also love whiskey. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll call them out. And they Martin don't <laughs> no, no, I don't, unless I'm driving somewhere to go to a whiskey tasting. Right, right. <laughs> but, just, um, just to make that clear. No, they don't miss. Um, um, and and honestly, my love for whiskey has actually taught me a lot about concrete because of the the nature of the craft and the nature of the material. Right. So we can go into that in another podcast. But to me, they're very, very related. Concrete and whiskey are very related, uh, and I I kind of put them together a lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, in in my personal style, in the way that I talk about concrete, in the way that I love concrete, it's very similar, right? Um, and and I'll call him out. Martin Dickerson at the last Legend event brought me three bottles of great whiskey, and I'm I'm just I was over the moon because two of the bottles were one of my favorites, which is Frank August. So if you are into bourbon and you haven't tried Frank August, go try it. Um, but you know, those are two things that, uh, from a hobby standpoint, I'm very passionate about. I like to work on cars. Uh, Jeff, I know you share that. Um, although the cars you work on are different than the ones I work on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and so I wanted to, you know, take two or three minutes and just like, quote unquote, break the ice. Like, you know, if you're an alumni, obviously, you know, we want you to text us and call us and hang out and whatever. Like if you're in town, let us know, we'll go have a beer, um, or a glass of whiskey. Um, not Jeff. He doesn't like whiskey. There's it doesn't like me. It doesn't like him. It might if his if his uh his memory would let him get over it. But um mm -mm. so uh yeah, um Jeff, two hobbies, real fast. Audio and music. Well, they go together. That's that's my primary passion. Um You are an audiophile, it's true. So in high school, actually when I was growing up, my like I come from a my, a lot of my family are not afraid to roll up their sleeve and get my hands, they get, get their hands dirty. My dad used to, uh, by necessity, work on cars. He always had old Datsun, mostly Datsun pickup trucks. Um, and, Hard you know, I remember every, you know, cleaning the carburetor, you know, getting all the gunk out, cleaning the carburetor on the, on the dining room table. Um, well, kitchen table, we didn't have a dining room. Um, and in high school, my, my uncle restored cars. And so I'd go spend a month with my aunt and uncle and my three cousins. And uh, he had a, I can't remember what year it was, a 1960 something Corvair, right? So it's the, the, the mid alternator said unsafe at any speed. So he was restoring that. And I remember when I was little, when he got it, I'm, I'm older than my other three cousins. And my uncle, my uncle Bob, got that car before my oldest cousin Keith was old enough to help him work on it. So it sat up on blocks on, on jack stands in the, in the garage for years, waiting for them to get old enough before mm -hmm. they could start restoring it. Um, 
so that was that was pretty cool learn to work on cars that way and um so you know a little bit of body work and all that of course there's only so much you're going to let a a, a teenager do on a, on a car but yeah, you know yeah. learning how to bang out metal and do you know bondo and paint and sanding and lots of sanding like a, learn how to do wet sanding um honestly i guess this is where the appreciation on... for coatings came from because yeah. if you think about it with the exception of one car that i know of every car has paint on it and it's not just to make it look pretty well so, now too because because the the cyber truck is stainless steel. Okay, yeah, but that doesn't exist yet. Well, kinda. Hmm. They've, put out, they've put out one or two. <laughs> All right, right, yeah, okay. Um, fair enough, two. But that's 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 a small number that, in the grand scheme. It's a very small number compared to however many cars there have ever well, been. Well, and one thing I wanted to note about coatings is if you ever have a rusty car and you want to keep it looking the same way without it deteriorating, what do you do? You clear coat it. You clear coat it. (laughs) So you can keep the patina and protect it. Yeah. Every resto mod builder knows that. Absolutely. Um, So there's that, you know, cars. um, I used to work on cars a lot more. Now I don't. Oh, you still work on your cars. Come on. I still work on my cars. Yeah. I like tools. What are you doing? I'm changing the brakes out. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm doing body work now, dealing dealing with stone chips. So oh. yeah, doing color matching and making making a, a repair look like factory perfect. Um, I'm learning how to do that slowly, but so I'm you're using your color matching skills for your yeah car. Yeah, yeah. How Metallic do you do that? You just go get a paint is of... not easy. No. <laughs> no Especially no. 23 year old me- faded metallic paint. Uh, it's not easy. <laughs> That's anyway, why the factory paint doesn't work. You get because right. you get it, it's, it's too dark. And then, um, so music has always been interesting. My dad, his other hobby was he, when he was in, I guess when he was in high school and when he was college, he was a ham radio. He was into ham radio and mm-hmm. did that. I never was into that, but he liked electronics and things like that. And I have my you, ham radio certificate, just FYI. Do you? Cool. I do. Right. Do you have your spam certificate, spam radio no, certificate? Yeah. I don't have spam radio. Um, maybe I do. Uh, I mean, maybe I am spam. I don't know. But. Yeah. So he was, um, if, you, if you, any of you are old enough to remember Heathkit, you could order these kits of electronic parts. I built my, I built a digital clock when I was nine years old. Oh, so cool. you buy the, has all the parts and you solder it together. So yeah, take the transistors and solder them to a board and all that. So I built my first digital clock when I was nine and he built, you know, radios and he built a television. Um, that took a long time, but he did, he did that. So I learned, I learned that it wasn't, you know, not to be afraid of doing things like that, learning cool stuff. And, um, he gave me, uh, a st- an old stereo that he, he had built. And, uh, again, as a kid, it's not like you make it up and have to figure out the electronics. These are like, you, I don't think they exist anymore, but you could, you, you buy a box of parts, you put them together. So it's like Ikea, but on a much higher level. Mm-hmm. And so that's where I got really interested in, in music. And so I can't, you know, I still haven't figured out where to blow into a piano to make it work. I can't play an <laughs> instrument. Um, but I love listening to music. I love listening to live music. And um, I got passionate in college about building loudspeakers. And in and when I graduated from grad school, um I I really got into hardcore designing, you know, had all this very early electronic modeling software for modeling electronics, uh the crossovers and things like that, looking at frequency response and time chain time time alignment and all that stuff. And so it took like three years to develop, to build my own speakers. And in the process of doing that, it's like, I just don't want them to sound good. I want them to look good too. So I had to teach myself woodworking. So that's where, you know, I bought the Powermatic table saw and I had all, all kinds of goodies. And I, you know, got into learn you know, old antique hand planes and learning how to hand cut dovetails and all that fun stuff. So working with wood was cool because I, I liked the way it looked. and. So those two 
kind of came together in that one hobby of building loudspeakers. And I still have a couple pieces um, that I've that I've made from long ago. I've sold off. I sold off many of them that I built to some to some people that I knew. And um, this is not recent, but I I built a concrete subwoofer. So you've seen yeah, it. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. And, and we need to post a picture of it somewhere because it's really freaking cool. And I actually had the thought, Jeff, that that could be a really neat, like, class thing. Like, what? why don't, why don't we design? Here's a thought. I've already designed a, a concrete, a, a Bluetooth speaker. Yeah. So. No, why don't we legitimately? I have a couple of Sonos speakers in my shop, but I'd love to bring them home. Like, why don't we design a Bluetooth concrete sound system to put in the shop for listening to music during class. Yeah. I mean, why the heck not? It would be fun and it'd be mm -hmm. a cool project. I don't know. I, I get yeah. off on really cool projects. So, um, you know, uh, that's the other thing. And I promise we're done. Uh, but if you have a cool project that you would be interested in doing in class and you're coming to class, let us know. Uh, we've already got the ones planned out for the GFRC in November 9th and 10th today. Um, and for December. So we've got projects for that, uh, but we are working on dates for next year. Um, mm -hmm. And we're also uh, in the process of, of kind of figuring out how we're going to one up ourselves next year when we do a big event. So yeah, <laughs> get excited for that. Um, so we want to connect with you guys. Um, obviously if you are new here, like comment, subscribe, all those things, mm -hmm. um, join us on the website, read the blog. Uh, we'd really love to see you in a class. Uh, we've got, you know, like we said, two coming up, um, November 9th and 10th, um, and December 4th through 8th. Um, and those links will be in the description and, uh, on the website and on the Instagram and on the Facebook and on the blah, 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 blah. So, yep. um, we want to get to know you. We want to see you. We want to hear from you. We want uh, to relate to you and help you on your journey in craft concrete. So thanks for uh, listening to our hour and a half TED talk. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for joining us. Uh, and, uh, we'll we hope you week. come back next week. Absolutely. All right. See ya. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Maker in the Mix podcast. If you liked the content and want to hear more, please like and subscribe. Uh, feel free to follow us on YouTube as well as Instagram, Facebook, and check out the website, www.concretecountertopinstitute.com. And of course, we'd love to see you at one of our upcoming classes. Tune in next week for more informative content. Thanks.